Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, new webinar organized by INDUST. As you may know, I'm Sarah Babart. I'm the chair of the Cost Action INDUST. And today uh, I will be with me in the webinar to chair in the session Ernest Werner, who is the working group uh, vice leader of the group of determination and capacity building. He's, he's uh, sharing the screen, you can see him, he's, he's, he's with us. And also the oral speaker of today, which is already the guest. And just I will take the, the floor to Ernest for the introduction. And uh, you yeah. have, as usual, you have to know that uh, you can put your questions in the questions box that you will find in your menu. And we will try to answer your questions during the session if they are uh, something that we can uh, answer. But in any case, at the end of the session, that will be around 40 minutes talk. Then we will have 20 minutes for discussions and questions that you want to raise. And thanks a lot for your participation. Okay. Maybe thank you. we can wait. Maybe we can give one minute or two more because I can see the number of attendees are increasing. <laughs> Just one okay. minute more, Ernest. Okay, no problem. Also, I, I would like to mention that Ernest is, is the technical director of the World, Organization, the World Meteorological Organization Sun and the Storm Warming Advisory and Assessment System in the, for the Regional Center of Northern Africa, Middle East and Europe. And he is also taking part of this initiative for promoting the access to the information related with us to different communities. And we are super glad that he will be also on board and part of the core group. Yeah, just remember, you can write your questions in any moment of the seminar in the questions box. You can type there your questions and also you can use the chat function if you want to communicate with someone in the meeting. Ernest, I think that we are now 52 persons connected, then we can start the webinar. Okay, uh, let's go. So uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to this uh, third uh, in that webinar. Uh, the topic of uh, today's webinar is short-term uh, health effects of desert dust. And well, our speaker will be uh, Aurelio Tobias. I'm uh, going to introduce briefly Aurelio. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Aurelio, by the way. So, um, Aurelio Tobias is um, Associate Professor at the Spanish uh, Research Council in Barcelona and also a visiting Associate Professor at the Nagasaki University School of Tropical Medicine and Global Health. And uh, his research interests uh, focus on environmental epidemiology, uh, studying the health effects of env environmental risk factors, including air pollution, desert dust, and climate change at the global scale. Um, he has led the Spanish project funded by the Ministry of Health uh, to study the short-term uh, health effects of desert dust and also uh, this, the systematic review of the literature on this topic uh, for the World Health Organization. Um, he has a wide track of publication with more than 200 papers published among these papers, uh, he has recently published uh, with uh, Massimo Stratafoggia, Stratafoggia, I think, a uh, standardized uh, methodology to modeling desert dust exposure in epidemiological studies uh, for the short term effects. Um, both Aurelio and Massimo uh, coordinate the group of uh, on health in this uh, in our uh, cost action in dust. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, we can start now. So, Aurelio, if you are ready, I give you the floor. Good, thank you. So, thanks, uh, Ernest and, and Sara, for the introduction. 
and thanks to Indas for inviting me at, at this webinar. So as Ernesto already said, I will present the work that I have been doing during the past years on the health impacts of uh, desert dust. Uh, these are the, the contents for uh, this talk. So I will shortly describe uh, the background. Next, uh, I will define the types of health effect, the effects that we account for in, in epidemiological studies. Uh, I will also introduce uh, briefly the, the main concepts of the time series design and address the short-term effects uh, of desert dust. And finally, I will share some conclusions on the future, uh, the future uh, research topics that uh, we are working on. So, uh, but let me start presenting uh, this timeline uh, on the research between desert dust and health uh, in Europe. So in, in, in the late 90s, I participated in the AFI study, which was uh, the first multicenter uh, study uh, on the short-term effects uh, of air pollution on health. But it was more than 10 years later that uh, we began to study the health effects of desert dust in Europe. And then more recently, the, as, as Ernest also already mentioned, the World Health Organization commissioned us uh, the systematic review on the health effects of desert dust. And it was when Sara uh, and Nico invited us uh, to lead the health group in, in the Indust uh, action. So, uh, several studies uh, already review the evidence on the health effects of desert dust, but all these conclude that the health effects still remain unclear. I mean, for this reason, the WHO just commissioned the, the systematic review that I mentioned, but, you, but using a standardized protocol. But as in the previous reviews, we found that the main differences between the published studies were because they use different study designs and statistical analysis to address for the, short, uh, for the uh, health effects of desert dust. They also use different health outcomes and lag effects. Of course, they use different methods to identify the dust events. And more important, they uh, use different metrics for the desert dust exposure. Uh, there are two types of health effects uh, that we need to differentiate in, in the epidemiological studies. The short-term effects are those quantifying, uh, quantifying the acute impact on health after an immediate exposure. And here, the time series is the more frequently used study design. While the long-term uh, effects uh, refer to the chronic health effects after a cumulative exposure. Uh, and these usually require collecting individual data from cohort studies. Both designs allows, uh, allow estimating exposure resp the response functions that are necessary for the health impact assessment at the short or the long term. Uh, however, in the WHO systematic review, we only found evidence regarding the short-term effects of uh, desert dust. So then let me run a short introduction on, on the time series uh, design. So we want to answer, uh, usually we want to answer this uh, general research question. Is there an association between the day-to-day -day variation in a given environmental exposure, for example, high pollution or in our case, uh, dust, and the daily risk of a given health outcome, for example, a mortality or hospital emissions. However, the health outcomes and the environmental exposures are characterized by having similar time trends. So this is an example of daily mortality for all natural causes uh, in London uh, for five years, and the average daily temperature and, and so on. So in, in blue, the blue line, if you can see clearly, is the, the daily mortality, the red one is the temperature, and the green one is the, the ozone. Uh, but as you can see here, when mortality decreases, temperature increases as well as ozone. 
But when temperature reaches the summer peak, mortality also increases uh, substantially, especially in the peak of uh, 2000, in the summer of 2003, because of the uh, heat wave that uh, impact Europe. So, however, we usually don't have access to individual predictors of mortality or hospital admissions beyond the usual variable, uh, variables of age group or, or gender. So then we need a study design that relies on the between day comparison within the same population and also should be able to control for these similar time trends in both the, the environmental exposure and the health outcome. And this is the time series designs where we need to collect data long enough, uh, at least three to five, three to five consecutive years of daily data to identify properly the day-to-day -day variation that uh, will allow us to disentangle the short-term effects from the time trends. Uh, the main strength uh, of the time series design are the use of administrative collective data from national statistics or the health department, which are, let's say, relatively easy to get this just by applying to the, to the appropriate uh, institution. And here, the same population is compared with itself over, over time. So the individual risk factors uh, are not changing over time, and therefore they are controlled by design. Uh, but it, has, it also has uh, limitations that we must consider properly. Uh, this first, the, the first one is that this is a design based on aggregate data, because as I mentioned, individual data is not uh, fully available. So uh, it cannot be used to study long-term or chronic effects. So it can only be used to address for short-term effects. And more importantly, we must to account properly for, for the time trends. So, because th this is a classic example by Jules uh, in, the, in the 20s. He collected the mortality rate in England and Wales between 1850 and the beginning of the 20th century, which is the one in, in, in red color, and the rate of marriages by the Church of England, which is the one in, in blue color. And he found quite a strong correlation showing that uh, um, that mortality that, that mortality raises when the marriages increases so in these days any brilliant politician could think that uh, we should forbid to get married to prevent mortality but uh, this is happening because in in this context in this framework Time is what we call in epidemiology a confounding variable. It's a variable which is related with both the environmental exposure and the health outcome. Both are collected at the same time over time. So we need to account properly uh, for, for this confounding effect to study the association between the environmental exposure and the health outcomes. So how can we do this? We can do this by accounting for a temporal decomposition of the time trends, fitting in the regression model, the time components for the long trends and the seasonality of the daily data. So this is the example at your, uh, at the, at your right panel. You have the example of the temporal decomposition of the daily mortality in London. So you can see that there is a long time, uh, a long trend that shows a decline uh, in mortality. In the middle panel, you have the seasonal pattern, which is repeatedly showing the same shape of, looks like a kind of U or W shape uh, year to year. And at the bottom panel, you have the residual component, the, the white noise after uh, fitting properly these uh, temporal trends and seasonal pattern into the regression model. So, of course, in the Jules example, this correlation between marriages and mortality disappear 
after accounting for the for the temporal patterns. So now you can get married without feeling guilty about increasing mortality. Uh, however, to study the short-term effects of high pollution and once again, in, in our case, dust, desert dust, we must also control for other factors related to the environmental exposure and the health outcome. And these are mainly calendar effects like the weekends, public holidays and meteorological variables like the, the average daily temperature and the relative humidity. So, and finally, this short introduction to the time series design, the association between the environmental exposure and the health outcome can show different shapes that we need to account properly. For example, the temperature mortality association uh, used to be a non-linear showing a U or a B shape, while the high pollution mortality association shows to be linear. And we also need to account for the lagged effects. And this is because today's mortality is associated with today's pollution and also with the pollution levels of previous days. Uh, but now let's move in, into dust as our main environmental risks exposure. So here we will start showing or thinking that the, probably the, the most intuitive approach is to consider dust as a binary exposure by classifying the days of our time series in two groups, those affected by dust and those non affected by a dust event. Uh, under this approach, it allows us to answer the following research question. So is the occurrence of a health outcome higher on dust days in comparison to non dust days? So in the time series design, of course, after accounting properly for the time trends, the calendar effects, and the meteorological factors that I already mentioned, we basically compare how much higher is the daily mortality on days with a dust event here in the time series is are those highlighted in this sand color in comparison with the days without a dust event, which are the, the, the remaining ones with the white background. Uh, however, the exposure studies have suggest that the composition of particulate matter may be different on days uh, with dust events. And this could cause different health effects of PM depending on whether it is a day with dust or without dust. And this approach leads us to entirely completely different research question, which is now, is the association between PM and the health outcome different between dust days and non-dust days? So here you should note that now we are considering PM as the main risk factor to be associated with the health outcome and desert dust is now here considered that we call in, in, in the epidemiological studies an effect modifier of the PM health association. So, however, both approaches have reported similar findings, mainly showing an increase of for hospital admissions for respiratory causes, mainly related to asthma, and mortality for cardiovascular causes. Uh, but both approaches have, uh, have limitations as well. So when considering dust as the main risk factors, all the dust events are treated in the same way. So they are not providing information on the exposure, on, on the amount of dust. So we cannot estimate the, the exposure response relationship that therefore we need to conduct a health impact assessment. And when considering dust as an effect modifier of the PM health association, it, in, it is not possible to attribute the health effects to a given source because PM in these in studies, PM is usually measured, comes from, from the measurements uh, at the local monitoring stations 
mainly are uh, background uh, or, or traffic stations. So, however, the main limitation uh, under this approach, of course, is, is the method that the studies use to identify the dust events. For example, the studies conducted in Southern Europe, uh, they use a combination of meteorological products, aerosol maps, and um, back trajectory analysis to identify which days were affected by a dust event. In Asia, they mainly use uh, visibility as a criteria, and in the Middle East, they use daily daily excedences of uh, PM concentrations. Uh, but a, a more accurate approach will be then uh, quantifying somehow the amount of dust at the ground level. This uh, will change the exposure metric because now we are considering dust as a continuous measurement. And this will lead to a new research question, which is, are the natural and local sources of PM independently associated with uh, a given health outcome? So the source attribution of PM lead us to consider two independent exposures which can affect health. So here you have uh, at the top panel. So you have the natural contribution or the desert contribution to, to, P, to PM10. And as you can see, of course, is equal to zero in those days without a dust event and is quantified with some amount of microns per cubic meter in those days noted in, in these uh, black dots with a dust event. And here we have a second independent source, which is uh, the contribution, to say the local contribution to PM10 or the non-desert contribution to PM10. That uh, in this case is measure all the period long without, of course, any zero, uh, but it can be differentiated in those days with and without uh, dust events. But once again, the exposure studies observe that uh, a lowering in, in the mixed layer height during dust episodes allowed uh, the, the engagement of the local pollution. And then this could cause different health effects of the local uh, contribution, so the, <coughs> the non-desert contribution to a PM depending whether is a, a dust day or not. So in other words, uh, under this approach, we are generating three independent exposures. The one that comes from the natural or the desert source to PM, and then the local source and non-desert source uh, to PM can be split somehow in two independent sources accounting for those days with uh, a dust event and those days without the dust event. So under uh, three up and under under this this approach that we name it the, the three source model in comparison with the previous one that we name it the, the two source model is that the previous research question which was are the natural and local sources of PM independently associated, associated uh, with a health outcome can be extended to a second research question, which is, and this association between the local sources of PM with the health outcome can be different between dust days and non-dust days. So the, the, the problem is that very few studies have been conducted uh, under under this more complete view of the to study the health effects of desert dust. Uh, in in as far as I remember, there was uh, two studies that were conducted in five uh, prefectures in, in in Japan, and these studies reported that Asian dust 
had a larger effect than uh, suspended particle matter, which is the kind of PM10 is more close to PM7.5. This is the way that they are measuring the the coarse particle, the, the coarse fraction in 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 Japan instead the usual PM10 that we are working with here in, in Europe. Uh, they found that, uh, as I was saying, that the Asian dust had a larger effect than the SPM on cardiovascular mortality outcomes and ambulance calls for respiratory causes. Uh, because once again, in Japan, they are not using hospital admissions for their, their epidemiological studies. They prefer to use uh, ambulance calls as an indicator uh, for morbidity. But uh, in a multicenter study conducted by my colleague uh, Massimo Stavoggia in 13 uh, Southern European cities, uh, he found similar effects of PM10 from the local and the natural sources. But in, in this case, the, uh, the natural sources was mainly coming from, 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 the, from the Sahara. So, however, when, when accounting from the, from the three sources, the natural contribution, uh, the natural contribution to PM10, and the local contribution to PM10, depending on whether is it a dust uh, day or not. Uh, there are only two studies published in Barcelona, and the the one recently that we did use as an example in in our methodological paper, uh, and both found uh, found that the PM10 from the local uh, source during the dust days seems to be more harmful uh, to health than uh, in absence of a dust event. And of course, more harmful than uh, the natural source, the, the Saharan source. Um, this approach is suitable I mean, these uh, approaches of the two uh, source model and the three source model is suitable to estimate the exposure response function that next can be used in a health impact assessment. But once again, the key point is the method that we are using to disentangle uh, the sources of PM. Uh, the mentioned studies conducted in Japan they did use LIDAR to quantify Asian dust. While the studies in Southern Europe, including, including those in, in Barcelona and Rome, uh, we use uh, the European reference method. Uh, however, uh, ensemble products or reanalysis data, such as those from the WMO, uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, CAMS, uh, from Copernicus or Mera uh, from NASA can also be used, but as far as as far as we know, uh, they have not yet been used uh, in any epidemiological study. So, uh, in any case, we should consider that PM is a mixture of uh, natural and local sources, even within the dust days. So, to our understanding. Uh, this approach that we named the three source model could be the more complete way to address for the short term effects of desert dust on health. But uh, this approach has a limitation. Uh, this approach might not be useful in hotspots with uh, high concentrations of uh, local pollution. For example, in, in cities in, in Iran, in Iran or, or, or in the Middle East, than they have more than a half, more than, more than a half days uh, in a year affected by large dust storms. But uh, then in the days without being affected by a dust storm, the levels of uh, air pollution are uh, much higher than those suggested by the, by the WHO. So, in summary, uh, the apparently simple question of does desert dust affect human health requires a proper understanding on how the dust exposure has been modeled 
in the epidemiological studies to develop uh, appropriate measures to, the re to reduce local pollution during uh, dust events. Because from the most complete view produced by this uh, three source model, we have found uh, evidence, consistent evidence in, in at least in, in Southern Europe, that uh, the local pollution seems to be more harmful uh, on dust days than in non-dust days or even the, the natural source. Uh, but for these reasons, we, we need we think that we need to standardize the epidemiological studies using the same methodological characteristics to make the health effects comparable in and near hot spots, which is the, the, the main aim that we had in the methodological paper that Ernest mentioned at the beginning of, of this webinar that we recently published in the epidemiology journal with, with Massimo. Um, this, uh, we, we think that with this standardized procedure will help us understanding the difference in the health effects between dust affected areas like in, in the South Mediterranean or in the hot spots like in, in the Middle East. And uh, finally, there is an urgent uh, need or an urgent requirement to develop uh, an appropriate epidemiological uh, study design to address for the long-term effects of desert dust. Because as I already uh, mentioned, when during, during the, the systematic review that we did conduct for, for WHO, we were not able to find uh, any published study uh, trying to assess for the long-term effects of, of desert dust. <clears throat> but uh, what about what what have been doing in the in the Indust Health Group? So we organized uh, we did organize two technical meetings. The first one was in in Barcelona two years ago, and the last one was in in Rome just around one year ago. Uh, it was in fact the last travel that most of us did because in the way back, at least in the way back to Barcelona, the COVID cases uh, start uh, raising up and three weeks later, we were under, under lockdown. And since then I have been, I have been at home. So, um, but the, the, the aim of this group, these technical meetings were to establish collaboration between epidemiologists, exposure scientists and, and modelers. And in these meetings, we discuss about the availability of uh, measurements and products to identify dust events and sources for natural and local contributions to PM. And also the methodological characteristics to help developing standardized studies protocols for the short and the long term effects. Uh, we already accomplished the idea of developing a uh, study protocol for the short-term effects, which is the paper that we publish in epidemiology. And in, in the next uh, meeting that we plan to conduct, should be online, of course, we plan to conduct uh, shortly. Uh, we will start tackling how to, how to address, thinking how to address uh, the studies for the long-term effects of desert dust. And we think that this will be very helpful to provide uh, guidelines for, for policymakers. So meanwhile, we engage, we are engaging now a multi-center study as a part of the MCC Collaborative Research Network. MCC stands for <coughs> a multi-city a multi-city, multi-country collaborative research network, which is a, a network of researchers that provide, provide data to develop the, large, uh, the largest uh, data set ever ensembled to study the environmental stressors like uh, temperature, extreme, uh, extreme temperatures and air pollution on daily mortality. The, the, the last update of the of this of this data set was in I think it was in in February no way in February no, it was in December 
was the last update. And now uh, we are already including data from at least 700 cities from 14 different countries, including a wide, uh, a wide covering, a wide range of uh, climate. And we notice that most of these cities and areas are, were, are already affected by, by desert dust. So jointly with our colleagues from, from, the, from the MCC study, we did decide to engage this MCC in dust study, planning to, to take advantage of the data, especially the health data already collected by the MCC collaborators, just to study the short-term effects of desert dust in areas affected by uh, dust and hotspots using a standardized methodology. So we are now in, in, in the process of collecting data on daily mortality, PM10, PM2.5, and also reanalysis data in areas affected by dust events and hotspots. These include uh, 36 cities in 18 different countries from four uh, different regions from the Southern Mediterranean and Caribbean, mainly affected by Saharan dust, in the Middle East, and in China, as far as I remember, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, mainly affected by Asian dust, and also data from several cities in, in, the, state, in the States, in the United States, Australia, and Argentina to cover other regions affected by, by dust. In, in this study, we aim to check the agreement between data for dust exposure, how good is uh, the reanalysis data, probably the one that we will use is MERA2, to be used in epidemiological studies in comparison with the uh, observed PM data. Uh, we also aim to check the feasibility develop a standardized definition for dust event to quantify dust exposures at the global scale, and also to explore the heterogeneity for the short-term effects uh, of desert dust attributable to sources, transport, and composition. And we are quite happy now because this project has called the attention of the WHO and they are uh, they they offer they help uh, to get to get uh, fund. So uh, just to end uh, this seminar, or this webinar, I want to thank your attention by sharing some photos of the impact of the Saharan dust uh, intrusion that we had last week in in not in southern Europe but also reached the Central Europe. And it was very surprising because most of this uh, dust was, was deposited in the, in the Pyrenees. And this is how look like the ski resorts in, in Northern Catalonia and South of France in, in the Pyrenees. And these are two pictures that uh, my colleagues at WHO sent me from, from Geneva, where, where the dust reached uh, Central Central Europe, as well as well as in other cities in in Germany and, and in, in in the Czech Republic. So I think this is all that I had uh, for this webinar. Uh, I think now we will enough time for yeah more than twenty five minutes for for questions. So just before finishing, so the acknowledgements to the to the to the in dust, of course WHO and the Japanese Society for the for the production of Pines. And thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks a lot, Aurelio, for your talk. Uh, we have some questions in the questions box. Then I still you have time to put your questions in this question box. And between Ernest, me and Constantina, that is not visible but is also here, we will try to Write all the questions for you. The first one is coming from Carlos Perez, and he 
He's asking, what is the hypothesis that could explain why the local pollution is more damaging during dust events in Southern Europe? Uh, hi, Carlos. Thanks for your question. So uh, we have seen now in, in, in Barcelona and Madrid and Rome that the, the head of the boundary layer is is reduced that by more by more more than a half during those days, and well, I'm, I'm not chemistry, but uh, especially uh, Xavier Querol and my colleagues and at, at IDAEA, they suggest that that this re reduction in the boundary layer could help uh, engage chemical processes that could make the local pollution more uh, more toxic, more harmful for health than, than during non those days. I think that it's clear, but maybe he's wondering also not just in Barcelona, maybe also in Eastern in Easter Mediterranean, oh. like in in areas where it's Greece and, and Turkey, for example. Yeah. Well, I mean what once again uh, for this reason, we are now engaged in this multi-center project, including including cities from different different uh, areas affected by dust or in hot spots. Because, uh, as I, I said during during my talk, uh, most of the evidence using dust as a continuous exposure mainly comes from two cities, which are Barcelona and Rome. So we don't have more evidence. So we want to apply this method to check if it works in other places. I have the, let's say, I have the feeling that it may not be useful in, in the Middle East because, one, as, as I also said in in my presentation, uh, most of the cities in hotspots they are affected in more than a half of the year by huge dust events. And in those days that they don't have uh, affected by a dust event or or a dust storms, the usual PM levels are uh, exceeding the WHO threshold for maybe 90 or 95 percent of of the days. So yeah, but you are you are right, Sarah and Carlos. It's something that we have seen in a very specific places that now we need to replicate in in other in other in other areas. In a preliminary study that we are conducting in Seoul and in Fukuoka in Japan, we have seen that it's happening the same, the same result. I mean, the same effect done in done in Barcelona or or in Rome. Thanks a lot for your explanation. Uh, if if you need further information, you can also contact Aurelio. If their answer is not fully accomplish your 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 yeah. expectations, but we have another one that is coming from Eleni Sat Sati. I, I hope that I pronounce properly, and she wants to know. She would like to know what are the criteria and the differences between long and short time health effects. Uh, you mean the criteria? What are the the, the criteria and the differences? Meaning, I, mean, I suppose it's basically the. I suppose that it's talking about the kind of effects that uh, is 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 related with short term health effects and what are the the kind of uh, illnesses that you have when you consider long term, and also the criteria. I suppose that is the methodology, but. I mean, the, yeah, yeah. The, the criteria is basically defined by the, the goal, the, the aim of, of your study. So we, we define a priority if we are interested to study short health effects or long-term health effects. And once we decide which is the, the, the health effects that we are mainly interested in, so then we need to account for the exposure. So the exposure, of course, could be at, at the at the at the long term, and then it will generate an acute health effect. For example, the ones that we are mostly interested in are uh, mortality or hospital admissions. Uh, at the long term effects, they are more tricky because the idea is based that uh, you can accumulate 
all of these short-term effects can be accumulated over time, and then it turns into a, a long-term effect. So for example, uh, eye pollution can affect us at the short term, because if today we have a, um, a pollution event with high levels of PM, for example, it can affect our health in, in a very rapid way, in a matter of in a matter of days, and then we can get admitted into the hospital or we can even die. But uh, even being uh, the air pollution levels uh, at the at, at low concentrations, we are accumulating over our lifetime the the possible uh, harmful effects that uh, the air pollution could cause. And we can study these long-term effects through chronic diseases, like for example, uh, cardiovascular or diabetes, or probably the, the most common one, or, or the most known one is, is cancer. Uh, of course, the problem for the long, to study the long-term effects is that you need to build a court, a group of patients uh, or a group of people and then follow them over time for a very long period. So this is uh, and this type of court studies, they are quite expensive and I mean, very, very difficult to, to conduct in comparison with the short-term effects studies where you only need to ask to the National Statistics Institute the, the daily counts of any given, any given health outcome that you are interested in. Thanks a lot for your answers. But we have more questions for you. Um, there is another one from Sihan Dundas, that is the Turkish representative in Indas, and he's asking you about if there is any potential relationship between PN10 and COVID-19. Well, this is uh, a hot, hot question, well, hot topic. This is not a desert that question, but uh, I will try to answer. As, as far as I know, the uh, let's say that the mechanism that uh, relates eye pollution with COVID is at the long term, not at the short term. So, in other way, in in other words, the today's pollution cut. I mean, it's very, very unlikely that can affect, that uh, can increase uh, the incidence of COVID uh, today or tomorrow or in at the short term. But there are several studies. Probably the most famous one is the one uh, published in, conducted in the in the states by by the University of of Harvard. That they show that the long term effects, uh, no, that the that the long term exposure of eye pollution, as I was mentioning before, it uh, generates more susceptible. Uh, more susceptible population uh, to get a worse COVID, and this is because if you have been living in a very in a, in a large polluted city for a very long time, your uh, respiratory health or even your cardiovascular system is more affected than if you have been living in the countryside in the countryside for your whole life. And in that case, if you expose these two different populations to the to COVID, it will be affect uh, more harmful to those who have been living in polluted cities than those who, who did not. Thanks a lot again. We have more questions. I don't know, Ernest, if you want to, to also Yes, maybe some there, of are, them. there are a couple of them that we can uh, merge some, somehow. It's about the number of studies that uh, uh, are being uh, realized on cities in located in desert areas, in, especially in comparison with the European cities or, or cities like Japan, uh, you know. Oh yeah. So in, in in the review, I didn't show this because I I thought that I didn't have enough time. Uh, most of the most of the evidence comes from oh. European cities and and Asian cities, and there are very very few ones conducted in in the Middle East. Maybe three, four at, at 
as far as I remember, in, no more than that. In, in the recent years, they have been published at least a couple more, but there are not too many in, in comparison with the ones that they have been published in, in Europe or Asia. And uh, there is a review by Florence Longueville claiming for this, but in Africa as well. So there are no studies conducted in, in Africa on the health effects of desert dust. And they, they are on site. And it's just a similar thing which is happening in, in, in the Middle East. I mean, there are a couple, three, four, five studies in, in Middle East in comparison with the tens that we have in Europe and the, not hundreds, but the 20, 30 that could be available in, in Asia. That this is a gap that needs to be filled. Our idea developing this standardized protocol is that uh, everyone now uh, knows how to conduct a study to address for the for the short term effects using uh, a common methodology. And we encourage when we are giving the seminar or we are giving the workshop on, on these methods, we're trying to encourage people from Middle East and Africa to to conduct their, their own studies, to, to generate more evidence on site. Because most of the evidence, as you said, Ernest, is coming from dust affected areas. Oh. And there is many questions related with the factors that uh, makes the dust more toxic. It's related with the mineralogy, with the size. This is a recurrent question in some of the participants. It could be, yeah. As I said, I'm not geologist, not chemist. I'm a statistician uh, holding a PhD in public health. So, uh, but as far as I know, we have been working with our colleagues at at, the, at, the, at IDEA. Uh, it could be, it could be, as you said, the the source, the composition, and also the the transport. Yeah, I mean, it could be these three factors are the ones that could be related with the, with the health effects. But the problem that we found in, in our review for WHO and, it, and also was found in the previous reviews as it is, as it, since all the studies, they did use different study designs, different methods to identify dust uh, events and different uh, metrics for the dust exposure. Uh, the results are not fully comparable to fully understand which is the strong related factor or factors that could explain these differences. So at the moment we are betting, so we are putting the money into these three, into transport, source, and composition. But it is something that we aim to explain in our multi-center study because we will use the same methodology to analyze, to analyze uh, all the the short-term effects of uh, desert dust in all the 40 cities that we already collect data. Also, Nick Middleton, that is, is part of, of INDAS also, is asking if also biological factors can be considered oh. are, are part. Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the question, Nick. Uh, yeah, also has been proved that uh, the dust can absorb uh, can absorb and transport. Uh, biological microorganisms. This is the idea behind the possible association between dust, storms, and and, and meningitis. But it has all be, it has also been proven in, in southern Europe and in in in, Co in Korea that uh, can absorb as well the industrial pollutant, the industrial uh, industrial pollutants over the journey. From the from the point source to the affected area. So in fact, this is something that I think it was Nick who asked me the other day as well. If uh, there was any association between between or any any study uh, start trying to assess the possible association between COVID and dust. So if someone is interested, so be my guest. Thank you. Um, 
There is another question for Daphne Barliarie that uh, is congratulate you. Most of the people is congratulate you for the talk, Aurelio, and thanks a lot for your time and for the presentation. And she said that it was stated that the, in your introduction, you said you state that the health outcomes and the environment exposures must have, see, must have similar time trends in time series analysis. Does this cover the 21st day or the, even the 30 day lag period for temperature effects on mortality? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't say it must. I yeah. said they usually have the same, the same, the same okay. time trends. But in our, yeah, in our analysis, yeah, since we are working with daily data, so we, we, we use proper, we can account properly for the for the length of each month and also within the within the well, I don't know how to say that in English these years that there is an extra day so we can account properly for the 29th of, of February as well I think Sarah is frozen <laughs> Yeah, I, I switch off my camera because I think that my connection is, is not really good. And she also is asking if there is a, a way to participate in this MAC study that you present or the MAC network. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, anyone is welcome to collaborate. So I think that I, I am sharing my, my screen because uh, you have here my, my email or you can contact uh, the Indus collaboration and they will they will reach me. So in fact in, in the study we are yeah so any help will be will be welcome because it's a huge task try to develop all the dust exposures and then run all of the all the epidemiological analysis and I guess that it will be even more important to have the to get the appropriate feedback once we get all the all the results to explain the heterogeneity that we expect that we expect to, to find. There are more questions. Maybe we can answer some of them more. Uh, one of them is, is related, is a colleague of mine, is Enza, that is also at VSC. And she's asking something that we discussed some time, and maybe you can write also for the audience is. Are you satisfied with the resolution of the meta reanalysis for your study? Uh, well, uh, I don't know yet because, because we are we are waiting to we are waiting for Sara to download the data in the right way. So I will I will answer this question in in a couple of weeks. I won't download the data. I will. Prepare the data for you. Let's say. But it's well, you you will help us um, to get data in the right <clears throat> in the right way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe related. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let me let me expand a bit the, the answer. <clears throat> in in this in our epidemiological studies, we are not as much interested in to get a very precise measure of uh, dust in a given point, in, in a given coordinate for a given date, than in the day-to-day -day variability, which is the most important thing for us. Maybe the resolution could be very precise or maybe it could be very wide, but if uh, the time series that we are getting for any given re a reanalysis product has the right day-to-day -day variability, this is the, the one which is more important for our analysis, it would be very different if we, if or uh, if we were interested in forecast. If we were interested in forecast, then the resolution will be very important because we will be very accurate for a given for a given coordinate for a given geographical area. But in our case, we want to get a kind of right representation, let's say, of the dust exposure, but more importantly, on on the day-to-day -day variation. Thanks a lot, Aurelio. I don't know if there is a time for a last question. It's one minute before four. four. Uh, 
I think that more or less the rest of the questions are partly answered because are related with the important factors to understand the toxicity of dust. This is the size. It's, it's more or less same uh, related questions to this main question about what is the key factor, let's say, that you have to... As, as far as I know, uh, there is another group in WHO, I think it's from the UCL in London or the Imperial College, I'm not sure now, that they are conducting uh, another systematic review but based on the toxicological effects of, of desert dust. So this, this, ah, this review will be complementary to, to ours on the, on the epidemiological evidence. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Aurelio. Thank you. Because it's four, we have to close the webinar today. Uh, we try to be strict in, in the time, then the people will know that we are really strict in time. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was super interesting. Uh, you have the contact of Aurelio in the website, but also in the webinar uh, announcement. And I want to say that Again, all the materials and the recording of the webinar will be available through the INDAS website. Then you can take a look and get uh, whatever you need. And also, I would like to announce uh, the next webinar will be on charge of Isadora Jimenez. She is the science communicate, communicator coordinator of INDAS, and she's a, she is a, a well-recognized specialist in the common science communication. And she will do a talk related with data visualization and the use of this data for user-tailored user products. And this is one of the topics of INDAS, is how we can connect with the users and to be more attractive for non-researchers communities communities and uh, mm. with this uh, I would like to thanks to all of you for your participation and we will share the questions to to Aurelio then if mm. there is something that he can explain better he will answer you no worries and I hope to see you in two weeks remember the next webinar will be 24th February at the same time same place have a nice day. Okay, bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye-bye. Bye, Ernest. Bye. Bye.